Welcome to the RC3. everybody to the Franconia Net Stage. I have the great pleasure to introduce you to Leonie, who has been active in higher education politics since 2015 and, among other things, they have been representative in the European Students' Union and an executive committee member of the Free Association of Students' Unions, FZS for short. And I also may introduce you to Lasse, who currently studying currently studying in, in Leipzig and who is representative rep president to the ARCA Student Council and member of the FZS. Their talk goes by the name Let's Get Digital, How the EU Envisions the Future of European Education. This talk will introduce you to current trends in the European higher education policy with special attention to how digitization is used to further strategic goals to the EU Commission. I'm happy to give the floor to Leonie and Lasse. Yes, hello, hello and welcome everybody. Um, we are uh, Leonie and Lasse, and um, we want to talk to you about um, European education policy in the following minutes. And uh, um, the core, the, um, the, um, we want to tell you about um, the what what the next decade will have in um, in pocket for for your for, for European education policy and. Um, um, have, an, have prepared a quite um, extensive agenda for you. Um, we want to tell you first about where this is all coming from and um, what the fuck the European Commission is doing and why you should care about it. Um, because those changes potentially um, have the potential to impact European education policy quite uh, strong, staunchly and also impact um, each and every university we know and um, the way we study and uh, research. Um, one of the core things in that is the, will be the European University Initiative, um, which we will uh, tell you in a, in a few details. Um, before, uh, afterwards, we will um, talk about mobility and social dimension. Uh, Leonie will talk through that. Um, and then uh, we will go into details of um, virtual exchanges and interna interna internationalization at home, um, and also micro credentials, which are uh, which is one of the biggest buzzwords buzzing around through um, European higher education policy right now. Um, we will also tell you about the European Student Card Initiative. Before we will speculate about um, the European degree, which is talked about in um, at, at some places, but it's quite uncertain what is meant by that by now. And um, afterwards, we will conclude our um, speech. Thank you. So what, what is the European Commission right, doing right now? Um, one of the, as, as you all know, as you all know, the European Union is um, has come under a, lot, under a lot of criticism recently. And um, the process is a bit. Um, the process of Europeanization is, is, has come to a, a steady decline, or it's gotten slower in the recent times. Um, you know all the buzzwords. Uh, the Brexit is happening. Um, they will be definitely leaving, or have been leaving uh, for two years ago, and um, also will leave the um, common market and um, the. Uh, on, on the 1st of January in two days. Um, but also the Fidesz party in um, Ukraine, in Hungary, um, or the Peace Party in uh, Poland are um, blocking further um, further integration of Europe. Um, but also on the international stage, Europe has come under um, on scrutiny, and so the European Commission and um, the European Council and the other institutions have come to the conclusion um, that uh, further steps to integrate Europe even further uh, are needed. And one of those could be, for example, the 
further integration of the markets, um, trying to enroll the euro onto other um, onto countries which currently don't use the euro as a currency. Um, but <laughs> also one of the core principles uh, in which further integration is sh shall be advanced will be education. Um, and so the, the, the Europe, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, all these principles have been lined out in a speech by um, Emmanuel Macron, which he gave uh, on the 26th uh, of September 2017. Um, his words were actually quite drastic, and um, I just highlighted um, that he's been talking of a European civil war, um, but also of the other side of the Atlantic. and. Um, Quite concisely describe the problem from his perspective. Um, it's surely also a reaction to his uh, his uh, victory over Marine Le Pen in uh, France. So um, he said that um, the European civil war is uh, halting um, the integration and the internal divisions uh, of Europe and the European Union um, have been a problem and their further steps are desperately needed to get over that. Um, he proposed a very broad um, array of things um, and uh, to, to overcome these internal divisions and to further integrate Europe. And one of the core things he mentioned was a culture um, under which Europe could be integrated. And um, it's, it's, it's very Eurocentric um, all in all what he said, but um, the speech he held at the Sorbonne, um, which accordingly was called the Sorbonne speech, um, had quite a big impact on um, the European Union and um, what will continue in the following years. Um, and uh, especially in the um, sector of higher education policy, because seemingly they diverge from the Bologna process and try to integrate things even further, but it's still quite um, behind behind the curtain of um, information kind of it's it's not it's it's still not really uh, breaching big publicity, I want to say. So um, when we look at the timeline, um, I just picked um, the date of the Brexit referendum as one of the um, things which happened in 2016, but you could also put in there the election of Donald Trump um, or other things, um, for example, the rise of China, which all seem to um, have, have had a big impact on the thinking and the worldview of Emmanuel Macron and of the European Commission. So things have been picking up. And then on the 26th, as I told you, of September, um, Emmanuel Macron held the Sorbonne, Sorbonne speech and mentioned for the first time the idea of creating European universities, um, which will be abbreviated in the future or in the coming um, speech of Leonie and me as EUI, um, meaning European University Initiative. Um, on the 14th of November, um, the Commission, the European Commission, um, published a communique strengthening European identity through education and culture and uh, laid out uh, quite broad visions and showed that they picked up um, Macron's ideas and um, um, also mentioned for the first time the creation of a European education area, which uh, Leonie will tell you about in a few seconds, uh, in a few minutes. Um, on the 22nd of May, the um, EU Council, the Education Committee of the EU Council, so the um, presidents of the countries, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, um, and all the other ones which were in, in power in 2018, um, and they combined the idea of uh, the European University Initiative and the European uh, Education Area and um, decided that they want to have the European University Initiative as a flagship of the European education area. Um, this developed quite rapidly into the first call for European universities. Um, 
uh, which ended on the 22nd, the 28th of February 2019, um, and 17 uh, European University alliances were selected under the European University Initiative. Um, another call ended this year, and um, there have been um, in total 41 European University alliances selected. Um, the German um, Ministry of Education had um, had a quite big impact on this whole process, which, um, as you can see, is a very, very rapid one for European policy in comparison. And they said um, they were staunchly in favor of creating a European education area, they were very, very supportive of the European University Initiative, and also um, set and followed through with the um, Giving money uh, from the uh, from the Euro German government directly to the European University alliances. Um, most European universities alliances, which have German universities in it, uh, receive money um, from the federal government. Um, as of now, and um, that money is handled through the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Agency, and um, that. So, so the whole process was very, very much furthered by uh, the German government, and um, in the in the back documents uh, from the 70s or from the last from the last century, there often has been an idea um, of creating European universities, um, mostly from German side, and it has been shot down uh, quite a lot uh, in the last century. So, um, from the French side, so that. That's quite a divergent from the back from from former times, and the hope of integrating Europe further by means of education. So now, um, Leonie will tell you about. Yes, um, so um, also I want to encourage you if you have any questions about abbreviations that we use or the terms, feel free to ask because we know that the whole um, the whole thing is very cryptic for people who are not um, spending a lot of their time reading these texts and talking about these concepts, so feel free. Um, and there are a lot of abbreviations going around and they are confusing. So there is the European Education Area or the EEA, which is um, this um, quote that I have here is taken from the Gothenburg text from 2017 um, in November, establish a European education area based on trust, mutual recognition, cooperation and exchange of best practices, mobility and growth. And when this paper was published, um, a lot of people who are involved in European higher education policy were really surprised because we already have a European higher education area or an EHEA since 1999. It was established with the Bologna Declaration. And interestingly, um, the basis for the Bologna Declaration was the Sorbonne Declaration, which was done a year before. So more or less saying we need a more new Sorbonne process for Europeanization <laughs> would be, and many people have seen it like saying, well, the European higher education area, which was, is also called the Bologna process has failed in a way to create um, an area built on trust, mutual recognition. Um, so what is the goal of the European higher education area? It is a collaboration um, between 49 countries um, who uh, want to build an area implementing a common set of commitments through structural reforms and shared tools. As you might know, the the EU has 27 <laughs> member states and the European higher education area has 49. So there is much more difference between those. And in this talk, we will not go into the whole impact that the Bologna process had on higher education in Europe at large, but we will mostly talk about the impact that the European education area has and in what way um, it creates a Europe of two speeds in a way like a Europe um, in the European education area, where there's a lot of money spent for um, the different initiatives, 
which we are going to talk about in the different programs, and the European higher education area, which has been trying for more than 20 years now um, to build the same thing, more or less. But the difference of the European education area, what the EU Commission is going to say, we are not trying to do something different because they are also um, want to implement mutual recognition um, in the field of vocational training and also schools. So that is like a huge difference. The European higher education area is for universities, universities of applied sciences, and the aim of the European education area is to um, address all kind of credentials, education that is happening in the EU. But there is not also a lot of worry that the other um, European countries, which are not members of the EU, might be left behind. And maybe Lasse can also address some of these concerns and when he talks more about the European University Initiative. The initiative, as you've learned, um, is seen as the flagship of the European um, education area um, and shall be new. Um, as I've told you already, it's, uh, it consists of 41 alliances with up to 10 member universities. So the idea is that universities um, and in different places in Europe get together and create a European University Alliance. Um, in the introduction, for which uh, I unfortunately for forgot to thank you all, um, I, it was mentioned that I'm president of the um, of the Arca Student Council. Um, I'm sure nobody really knows what that means of you or most of you, um, if there is no lucky coincidence. Um, it means um, Arcus is one of those European University alliances. Um, it consists of seven universities um, from uh, seven countries, and um, it has created um, an internal structure and also some form of a student council, um, which we are still in the process of creating. But um, we try to represent student interests through the student council, which I'm president of. Um, in total, those numbers add up, and there are 280 higher education institutions um, involved in the European University Initiative in uh, different alliances, and all of them get 5 million. Every alliance, every single alliance, gets 5 million euro from Erasmus Plus budget, um, which uh, probably will continue in the next EU budget, um, as far as I know, and um, also will has, has got, got the opportunity to use 2 million euro from the Horizon 2020 budget per alliance. And those 5 million euros are um, for a term of three years um, for the first call. And um, there are universities from all member states, uh, plus Iceland, Norway, Serbia, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Um, I will tell you about the um, the two speed part in a second when I am going to get to my maps, but first let's return to um, Emmanuel Macron's Sabon speech, um, where he again outlines what he thought and where the European universities are first mentioned. Um, because in the speech, the goals of Emmanuel Macron are for higher education area extremely um, ambitious, and I, I believe he didn't have the intention um, of fulfilling these goals because nobody can in the short term. Um, so in five years from 2019, where the initiative started to uh, 2024, um, there should exist 20 alliances or un European universities. Um, we don't know if there's a difference in his mind between European universities and European university alliances, but the central goal is highlighted um, that all students of these European universities shall be mobile between um, those universities. Um, in the first call, the goal set by the European Commission was that 50% of students enrolled in an alliance shall be mobile, um, shall, shall participate in mobility between the universities. Um, that means that um, in Arcus, where I'm again, President of the Student Council, we have 320,000 students um, in the, between those seven universities. That would mean that 160,000 um, students would be 
would participate in mobility during their study programs, which is extremely ambitious considering that uh, Erasmus um, has some numbers between um, 10 and 20 percent usually. Um, but let's look at how the uh, universities are distributed um, throughout Europe and, and to look at how the different speeds uh, are impacted. Um, which we, we can see here a map uh, where um, the university is participating in a near unit in the European University Initiative um, are counted up by a country. Um, Germany, for example, has got um, 35 um, universities participating in the European University Initiative, and the smallest number are Malta and Luxembourg, with both one. Um, as you can see, you can't see Malta. <laughs> but that's because it's so small, and I will just tell you what's happening in Malta. Um, Eastland also has got what, just one, and um, yeah, you can you can probably get what the numbers mean. And um, what what's most interesting here is um, um, Turkey, uh, Serbia, and um, the United Kingdom, um, because the United Kingdom has only seven um, universities participating in the European University Initiative. But it has got similar um, inhabitants as France, for example. So um, France with 37, 32 um, universities um, is just second in Europe. And um, also Serbia and Turkey have got some universities. But the two speeds um, is quite, quite different because um, under the European higher education area, um, also Ukraine and white Russia and Israel and Russia are included. And under the European education area, it's mostly just, just the core of Europe plus um, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. Um, because Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway are, um, are participating in the initiative as they would be a normal European member. Um, but Brexit has had its impact, and Britain is just on the, on the sideline of this initiative. Um, uh, which they are not in the European higher education area, uh, e.g. the Sabon and the Bologna process. They are normal part of the Bologna process, but not of the Sabon process, apparently. Um, we can also see the, <laughs> the regional distribution of everything um, and how many European, Univer European University Initiative universities exist per student. Um, so the normal number is between 50,000 and 100,000 students per university, which is surprisingly good. Um, when we compare it with, for example, the Excellence Initiative in Germany, um, which the, the, the ratio has been way worse um, for the students. And um, considering that students shall be involved, um, it's quite good. But it also tells us something about the regional distribution. and. Um, the most interesting finding here is that um, Poland is way underrepresented. They have got about 50,000 students more than um, the next closer one, which would be Greece. And the, f the third bad, worst represented country in the European University Initiative is actually Germany, even though they've got the most, um, which is because they've got the most students. Um, as you can see, also uh, the United Kingdom, Serbia, and Turkey are not included in this graphic because they would very badly distort um, the um, relations. Um, on the lower end, the best relations um, go to Malta and Luxembourg, um, which is basically just because they just got one university and not that many students, um, and also Iceland. Um, and one can only speculate whether things have uh, political um, reasons for these distributions. I'm, I'm more than certain that Iceland, Malta, and Luxembourg are represented for more or less political reasons. But whether Poland has, is, is being so badly represented um, is just up for speculation. I think it could be something with, um, have something to do with um, the authoritarian government in Poland, but um, I'm not that uh, good in um, Polish-EU relations to um, make a be better guess than that. Um, 
why Germany is on the third place is probably because um, Germany has got the reputation in um, the process of the European University Initiative to be um, the most eager to involve it. And, and from my experience working inside the area, Germany is um, and the German uni universities in the initiative are pushing the hardest for further integration. Um, and also, uh, which is completely unrelated to, uh, to whether students are pushing for it or researchers are pushing for it or the leadership of the universities is pushing for it because on all these three areas, um, the German involved, the persons involved from Germany are pushing, from my experience, the hardest, which is in of itself a, a big problem and can become even worse. And now I will hand over to Leonie again. For... Thank you, Lasse. <laughs> Thank you, Lasse. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some concepts and projects which are important if we are talking about European education policy and uh, things that are like, because we have to understand that the European University alliances are more or less an experimental field for the different projects that um, the EU Commission is doing to further European integration. Um, so in each of the projects or um, concepts could feel a whole lecture. So um, I will be very quick <laughs> about it. And if you have any questions, just um, pose them uh, through the channels. So um, what is mobility in the context of European education policy? So according to the European Commission, the European ministers have agreed to double the proportion of students in higher education completing a study or training period abroad to 20% by 2020. Support for mobility remains a core focus of the Erasmus Plus program. So mobility for students is defined as either spending a study period of 3 to 12 months abroad, um, which must be part of the student study program, or um, having a traineeship or work placement abroad in enterprise for two to 12 months. And this should be wherever possible integrated of the student study program. And um, it might not be surprising to you that those ambitious mobility quotas are very hard to fill, not only because we at the moment have a pandemic, which um, more or less uh, doesn't let people study abroad physically, but also because of the social dimension. So what is meant by the social dimension? Um, more or less, it describes all the circumstances um, that an individual student faces, like ability, social and economic background, um, which might impact his or her or their ability to go abroad or finish their studies. So if the European higher education area wishes to address the social dimension, they have to create equal opportunities in higher education in terms of access, participation, and successful completion of studies, studying and living conditions, guidance and counseling, financial support, and student participation in higher education governance. So what this means for mobility is that there has to be a portability of financial support. So if I'm getting um, disability um, benefits in Germany, that I can also take them to another country where I'm studying and removing barriers, providing incentives. So um, if I want to have more uh, mobile students, I also need to address the social dimension because there are barriers um, which not every student can overcome. And one of the biggest barriers um, to going abroad is the financial situation of the students, but also ability or care responsibilities. And um, so this brings me to, let's say, something that shouldn't be a solution to the problem, but is used in some cases as a solution to the problem that mobility quotas cannot be achieved. So virtual exchange and internationalization at home are buzzwords that are thrown around <laughs> about this, and I would call them mobility. So um, I could make a whole talk on both of these concepts because the problem is that they are used by different people 
to further different agendas. But um, generally, you can say virtual exchange and internationalization at home both describe um, international experiences with, which students can make without going abroad. So um, this might be digitally or not digitally, actually, because internationalization at home uh, modules that I have seen have also, for example, um, had the requirement of students to work in an enterprise or organization where the working language is English to have their international experience. And the important thing that I want to, you to take away from that is behind virtual exchange and internationalization at home, this is not mobility, how it is defined and how student representatives are demanding it to have. And most people who know what they're talking about would also never suggest to describe these offers as mobility. For example, the German Academic Exchange Service, the ARD, is um, doing a lot of research um, and best practice gathering on virtual exchange. And they always say this is not mobility. But there have been pushes by institutions, higher education institutions, to soften the borders between mobility and virtual mobility in order to hit mobility quotas and save money because if you want to send more students from your institution abroad it costs you money in counseling and you will have to get the funding for them and um, so and oftentimes as you might know higher education institutions don't have a lot of that um, but the EUAs the European University alliances are using the concept of virtual mobility to hit the mobility quotas because as you heard before uh, Macron wants that to wants all students who are part of a U European university alliance to have some sort of uh, international experience mobility so it pushes the member institutions of these alliances to in a way try to redefine what it means like shorter periods um, that are not three to 12 months, for example, or um, just counting digital um, forms of digital exchange as mobility. Um, so another thing that the European University Alliances are a testing field for, and it's going to haunt us in the future, is micro-credentials. Um, this definition that I have here um, is from the European Commission. A micro-credential is a proof of the learning outcomes that a learner has acquired following a short, transparently assessed learning experience. They are awarded upon the completion of short standalone courses or modules done on site or online or in a blended format. So micro-credentials originated from massive open online courses, MOOCs. And for some reason, the European Commission has decided that uh, micro-credentials make education more inclusive um, is accessible, a larger uptake of micro-credentials could, fo could foster educational and economic innovation and contribute to a sustainable post-pandemic recovery. Um, micro-credentials can be provided by higher and vocational ed education and training institutions, as well as by different types of private entities. So there is also like the aspect of um, people earning money by offering those courses and um, like big enterprises. There is also like if you might know that there are micro degrees, micro credentials already offered by Amazon and Google. And micro credentials um, as shown in the other three bullet points are really, really pushed by the European Commission right now. They are a flagship action of the European skills agenda. They're included in the September communication on achieving the European education area by 2025 and also included in the digital education action plan. So, and it's really emphasized that higher education should have a larger role in supporting lifelong learning and reaching out to a more diverse group of learners. And this sounds awesome, right? But the problem is that there is no evidence that micro-credentials boost innovation and inclusivity and higher education institutions are set up as competitors to other providers of professional development offers like vocational schools, Volkshochschulen, if you might know them here in Germany. Um, another problem 
is that the European Commission seems to have a very one-sided perspective on lifelong learning. So they really focus on self-optimization and anticipating the needs of the labor market, professional development. Another issue which is not addressed is who's going to pay for it? Because, um, of course, uh, developing these modules, these courses, is going to cost money to the for the higher education institutions. And I have been part of working on the recommendation of the German Rectors Conference on micro degrees and badges. And um, not everything is written in there I do support. And one thing that's written in there that to have cost neutrality for the higher education institutions of micro-credentials, they might um, ask the students to pay a fee for it. Um, and last but not least, cui bono. So who's really um, profiting from micro-credentials? Are it the learners or is it the employers who don't have to pay for um, the professional development? of their employees. And I think that it's really not the learners who are um, benefiting if more universities are doing this, but maybe this is something we can discuss in the end. So um, another thing which is going to make our whole learning experience in the EU better, faster and stronger is the European Student Card Initiative. Um, so as it is written in the communique from Gothenburg that we are mentioning again and again, to support this initiative on mutual recognition, develop and launch a secure electronic system for the storage and retrieval of academic diplomas to facilitate verification of authenticity. So the goal is to have full deployment of the European Student Card during 2021. Very excited to see that. Um, so the aim is that the European Student Card Initiative will enable every student to easily and safely identify and register themselves electronically at higher education institutions within Europe when moving abroad for studies, eliminating the need to complete on-site registration procedures and paperwork. Um, so the EU Commission has been um, implementing the Erasmus Without Paper Network to achieve this. And um, every institution who's part of Erasmus will have to, will be obliged to manage online learning agreements by 2021, manage interinstitutional agreements by 2022, and by 2023 to exchange student nominations and acceptances of transcripts of records. Um, also, the participating institutions will need to promote the use of the Erasmus Plus mobile app and by 2025, all students in Europe should be able to enjoy the benefits of the European Student Card Initiative. But where is the card, <laughs> is what I'm asking, because at the moment we only have an app. And um, supposedly in 2021 it will be. But um, there is more. The European Student Card can do everything. Um, it is supposed to give students the chance to access online courses and services provided at other higher education institutions. And over time, it shall allow students to enjoy cultural activities throughout Europe at discounted prices. It should also be linked to EU's electronic identification rules to, provide, to authenticate students. So it might be um, connected to the... Um, electronic identification that you are using in your passport, for example. Um, I leave it to your imagination what kind of data protection issues might come up with that, but supposedly it will make everything great again. So Lasse, would you like to tell us something about your experiences talking about this? Uh, all right. So. Um, Okay, I will go on. <laughs> um, so to come to the more speculative part of our talk, um, I have to um, <laughs> charge my laptop. Wait a moment. <laughs> okay. Technical break. So 
we are going taking you into the unknown of the European degree. So one of the aims of the European Commission, which is talked about a bit more behind the scenes because it's like more or less um, a very controversial point, um, is creating world-class European universities that can work seamlessly together across borders. Um, there will be mutual recognition of higher education and the convergence of grades, matriculation numbers and study programs. So as you can see a bit like the matriculation numbers, convergence might work about the European student card. Um, and I think here we see also like the big difference between the EHEA and the EEA, because the EHEA is really focused on having the different um, the differences of organization and structures, leaving them intact in the different countries. But if we want to converge all these things, we will need to have our structures be more similar in the future. So um, one thing that might be a benefit of it is that higher education institutions might be more autonomous from their national governments. There might be easier mobility of researchers and students, and there might student unions um, all over Europe might be more empowered by it. But there are also threats and problems like the elimination of democracy in higher education institutions, um, because um, there are going to be complex multi-level governance structures. Um, you see like on the, here in Germany, you can see it either like on a federal level, there's legislation on a national level, and there's also going to be EU legislation to consider. And um, Lasse, would you like to continue? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so so the, the coughing, uh, one, one, one problem which could fret everything is um, the stronger top-down approach towards everybody, which gets kind of like obstructed by the complex multi-level governance structures. Um, because when we when we converge with all these with all these uh, concepts like grades and study programs um, on a European level, it gets way more difficult for singular student actors or researchers to influence um, the structure of everything. So. When, when the study programs are converged throughout Europe, the Fachschaftsrat or the um, Faculty Student Council um, will have problems to um, bring forward their position um, because they have to also consider seven or six other um, faculty um, student councils. Um, also, um, the same problem as with the um, uh, Excellence Initiative, initiative in Germany, um, can emerge, um, which would build the free class system of higher education institutions um, of basically universities of applied science, the standard universities and European universities. Um, even though all the universities of applied sciences and the standard universities are trying to um, position themselves as being equal, and still in many um, places the, the right to um, give PhDs to um, researchers lies with the standard universities and also as we have as you have seen um, the risk is that there's no face-to-face -face teaching or way less and that has got problems in of itself but also some benefits but maybe there are other places to discuss the benefits and um, because the time is quite limited we have to continue with um, our um, conclusion um, yeah <laughs> More than the picture, of thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's Leonie's part. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Leonie, please. Um. All right. So, um, digitization is used as a tool to further European integration, like by um, introducing the student e-card, virtual exchange, possibilities and um, micro-credentials, which are really tied to digital ways of transferring grades and having grades um, recognized. But the measures create and uphold a Europe of two speeds. Um, the digital solutions are seen as a cheaper way to hit mobility quotas and social dimension goals instead of addressing those problems in a real way. 
Um, also, the impact of the tools and structures which are being put in place is not reflected upon sufficiently <laughs> because um, looking at each of the um, initiatives projects themselves, I also have a lot of um, reservations about them which are not addressed. And without significant engagement by those affected by these policies, there is a real danger of being excluded from decision-making processes. Um, so, it is very important to ensure democratic student involvement and the possibility of bottom-up approaches. And I would also really suggest to the EU Commission <laughs> to think about involving some privacy specialists before they are um, um, like doing things, because I'm really worried. <laughs> And now, um, five minutes after time, uh, we would like to conclude our talk and thank you all kindly for your attention and would be open for your questions now. So thank you so much for this very in-depth talk. It was super, super informative and very, very interesting. And for now, unfortunately, there are no questions yet, but I think they will come up soon when we processed all this input, as we know. So yes, I actually... I'm also sorry that we were so fast on some things, but it's really hard to know what to not mention in a way. <laughs> That's super, super okay. I would like to invite both of you, if you can spare the time, to our IRC chat if there are questions coming up for now. Or do you want to mention anything further information that you can spend with us? Um, I, yeah. could, I could tell you about do it, how Corona... <laughs> yeah, I can tell you about how Corona impacted everything because there has been a quite big impact um, by now, um, which is the current thing. And I think I dropped it out of the European University Initiatives. Oh. But um, we all know that the time frame and my call laid out is completely blown away by the pandemic. Um, most the European University Initiative start, the first one started to work in um, November of 2019. And um, most you know, European University alliances, alliances haven't had the opportunity to meet before the pandemic started. Um, the one I'm in, for example, planned on having a meeting on the 11th of March. And um, by then, the Italian fraction from Padua uh, was on complete lockdown and couldn't leave um, Italy. So um, everything was blocked. <laughs> and so the, the, the big tip from me is um, if you want to do some mobility, and you know that your university is a European part of the European University Alliance. Now is the perfect time to apply for funds because there is a lot of money lying unused around, and um, you can easily go to one of the places because everybody wants you to be mobile. So there can be some special deals, and you could you just need to ask around in your local um, institutions where you can apply for these grants, and also. Um, the whole time frame is kind of gone away, and um, we will see how that turns out in the future. But um, it's it won't like no goal will be achieved by 2024. That's kind of certain as of now. Well, time will come, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, they also wanted to be finished with the Bologna process in 2009, and well, yeah, okay, still going. <laughs> I see, I see. Mm, so, so if there are no questions, I can also talk a bit more about something that worries me about the European student card. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm just going to go back. So because if we are thinking about um, the plans for this and, and think it to an end, of course, it would mean that there would be uh, European student ID and it would make it possible to track students across borders <laughs> in a way with all the information connected and it's like really hard to know what kind of data protection is in place um, about that so and if it's all also connected to electronic passports so there are a lot of stuff that is a bit worrying about it 
But also what is more worrying is something that Lars and I talked about is that it, we kind of feel that the European Commission might not know how universities, higher education institutions actually work. <laughs> Um, and maybe Lasse, you might want to add something about like the communication issues you are facing inside of the European University alliances. Yes, uh, thank you. Exactly. Um, so it's the problem is that not only the European Commission um, knows how European uh, higher education institutions work right now, but apparently nobody knows um, how other European higher education institutions work. Um, it goes so far that uh, when we in our student council talk about our structures, we can't, we, we don't have words to speak together. And that's not because we are bad at talking English, but because, because the structures are quite different and um, uh, all these linguistic connotations um, get faded away. For example, we are, um, the, the Leipzig Student Union in Germany is called Studentenrat, so student council, but it was built on a kind of like a um, post-socialistic view after the fall of the GDR, because it was founded on the 9th of November of 1989. So the connotation that it has like, something to do with like some council democracy um, com gets completely lost. But we also don't know how the structures in uh, Spain are exactly working, because um, it's very hard to translate Fachschaftsbad into Spanish. And, um, <laughs> and I think that's, that says a lot. And I mean, we, we, we even have problems talking to our Austrian colleagues in German about our institutions because even there, they are difficult and different. And, and so we need new words and we need multilingual uh, lexicons um, building a common understanding before we can even move further. And even by creating this common language, we are deeply converging everything. And because the structures get similar and um, the views get similar and um, the student councils influence, influence each other um, in ways we haven't had thought possible, um, probably. So that's very, very interesting and um, it will become difficult. And, what that means for the student card initiative is that um, the, the ticket, how to use the um, transport and mobility in Germany, which is quite common, where you pay a fee of 180 euros or something in that bracket and can use the um, public transportation in your city or your Bundesland in your country. Um, it's difficult to tell that to the European Commission because Germany is kind of the only place where that exists and um, then they want to have like one common culture offer for all students throughout Europe. But then what happens to the University of Münster where they have a, a culture ticket where you can use your student card to visit the museums and the libraries and uh, the theaters for free just because you've got your student card. Um, how, how will you include that in the student card which will be distributed all over Europe? So because then the, the, the local institutions like the theaters and the museums will say like, no way we're gonna make it free for every student in Europe to use it if, um, if we are the only place doing so. And so the commission is getting into probably quite deep problems with, uh, with um, some of the initiatives because um, there are some implications of them which are um, going deep into the fabric of what uh, has been created around higher education institutions throughout the countries, which is also different from country to country. Very true. So different that we can't even really speak about it. So yeah, language barrier and further difficulties. <laughs> but I think they will get solved, I hope. <laughs> Well, what do you think, Nina? Would you use uh, a European student card? Do you think it's useful to you? I think it would be useful. I mean, I'm, I'm actually studying English, so for me, going abroad would be, of course, great. And I think, I mean, yeah. Yeah, of course you would use it. Maybe more in the beginning than later. But as you said, like museums, etc. 
that would be so useful for everybody actually and they would um just really not not just use it but i'm liking the words mm. i'm sorry <laughs> no problem I think but yeah it's, it's it, it would be problem. so convenient for everybody for every student i'm just seeing a question in the um there are IRC. Are there any plans to educate students in addition to the subject content or to encourage them to study more than just their sub subject? Mm -hmm. What would you think, Lasse? Is there some intention of broadening the curricula? I actually, I actually think it, it's, it's kind of like one of the few possible benefits of the um, Oh, what's the word? Damn. No. Of the micro credentials. Hmm. Um, because, but, I mean, but it will be, it will lead to the creation of weird sub subjects. And I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very difficult question because it's so broad and we don't know how it will develop. But, um, for example, my um, sociology institute in Leipzig is quite strict in what they um, teach and so on. And the, the participation of the University of Leipzig in the European University Alliance um, will broaden the sociology subjects at hand for me. Um, or not for me because I nearly finished with my studies, but um, you, can, you can use the sociology department of Bergen and um, without many um, hurdles because all hurdles shall be um, all walls must fall between the student study programs is kind of the official policy right now. Um, I see. Which we will see how that turns out. But, um, some some broadening will happen, but I, I don't see that um, the study programs get truly liberated. So you start at the university with like a blank, a blank study program and can just pick what you want. And, um, I see. Yeah. I think. So I we're think... running a little bit out of time right now. I'm really sorry, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Um, I would really invite you again to the chat. So um, if there are any further questions that might go there directly to you. So thank you again for this very, very informative talk. I will rewatch it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I mean, people can um, also reach out to us on what, however they want. I mean, over uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm Lemon Green Bird, if you want to find me. And you can just ask me questions about micro-credentials, for example, which could feel like a whole talk, me talking about it. Yeah. And I think also Lasse will be very happy to answer any questions you have about European University Alliances. And we are always looking for more people interested because we think it's important that people with a lot of different perspectives look on this issue and not only like those few people who are experts on that. So thank you again, have fun on the last day and uh, stay healthy and we see you another time. Goodbye. Welcome to the RC3.